thank you everyone and uh, as you know this session has been rescheduled and I think if we are talking about the disruptions caused by customer experience in a supply chain, I think we couldn't have started on a better note. And this basically just goes to show that what kind of uh, unpredictability we live with. Of course, few sessions went uh, uh, maybe extended and now we are here just to make sure that the audience, which is uh, customers for us in this case, are having a seamless experience and there are no gaps and delays. So, okay, so jumping right uh, into the topic, uh, I think from the perspective of customer experience, I am sure there are, there have been multiple sessions throughout the day, so we don't need to redefine the subject. Uh, now when it comes to customer experience, obviously we all go on digital marketplaces, uh, so many uh, products, uh, hotels, cabs or restaurants. So how many times do we really look for or do we really go beyond say uh, out of four, uh, out of five, four or four and a half stars from customer's reviews perspective, so maybe barely. Uh, so we are always looking at products or services which are rated more than four or 4.5 when it comes to the customer reviews. And if you go on any number of marketplaces, you will find that uh, what drives those ratings uh, go much beyond the product quality or the shopping experience. So it starts right from the brand introduction, goes to the, the buying experience and up to the post uh, sales service. Now obviously one of the key components that you will find over there is how the product was delivered, whether the product was delivered on time, uh, uh, whether I got the right notifications, could I properly track the progress of where my product was shipped from, look at the entire journey and then of course look at some other aspects. So I have seen so many times that the packaging, the way the product was packaged, that itself like you know is mentioned multiple times and it uh, uh, like you know looks at the way the customer has reviewed it. So to basically summarize the customer experience is completely at a different level. You see a lot of uh, quick service uh, apps which have come up which are delivering uh, you goods with a guarantee of 10 minutes. When it comes to brick and mortar store, they are struggling to keep up with D2C. So we have concepts like endless aisles and dark stores coming in. So the, the key point over here is that the customer is now dictating how the organizations need to run their supply chain. And the supply chain are no more just a function of cost efficiency and managing your inventory. So obviously the leaders from the supply chain world who are with us have seen this and they have been coping up with it. But apart from looking at what your customers want, there are also number of disruptions that have uh, been happening in the supply chain world. So I'm not going to again refer to COVID. I'm sure we are all tired of speaking about it. So I'll refrain from using the C word. But uh, even in the recent times, if you look at uh, the way uh, the Ukraine and Russia war has really affected the uh, commodities, or if you look at the China port blocking or the recent case of Indonesia banning the palm oil uh, exports, which has really affected the consumer goods market. So there are so many disruptions that they have to be aware of. So on other hand, we have ever increasing customer uh, expectations from the way uh, companies are dealing with them. On the other hand, uh, we have uh, 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 the supply chain uh, leaders who are struggling to shield the customer experience from the disruptions and uh, other cost factors. So uh, what we are trying to do over here today is uh, uh, de dealing, uh, is interacting with the imminent leaders that we have from industry and try to see how they are uh, reading the customer experience, how they are uh, looking at the way it has changed the game and how they are coping up with the new normals. So I'll start with uh, Dinesh, uh, who is uh, the head of uh, packaging and sustainability in Reliance Retail. Uh, so Dinesh, Reliance Retail is obviously the largest uh, retail player uh, in the country and uh, uh, you have about, I think, 16,000 plus stores. You have served millions of customers for products right from your daily grocery to premium brands like uh, Armani and Steve Madden. So if we look at the customer experience, how have you seen it evolve over the last say three to five years considering situations and the on-ground uh, things have changed so much? Thanks Mandar. Initiating this discussion, actually when you're saying customer experience, definitely today's world, the customer experience is the driving force for any e-tailer or retailer to uh, deliver products or redesign or design its solution which they are offering in the market. If, if you look at the recent surveys, you, you would find that 
uh, approximately 83 percent of 80, 83 to 85 percent of people or consumers have already or they are purchasing from e-commerce platforms only uh, both basically not only but uh, e-commerce and they have made purchases from that and today's customer is so aware that they they and they they are so awake and i would say they they know that they want to explore new brands they they, they want more information about the brand than the product at the same time their expectations are so high that they, they need personalization on the product. They are looking for shop attainment, not only the shopping, but entertainment also along with the product. And then obviously the payment options. Now because of this COVID, lot, lot, lot of us or lot of things we have learned in this post pandemic area and digital transformation has made it very clear that uh, single payment options are not viable now. Every, everyone has to have an omni channel as well as the different payment options on, on the platforms. Uh, this all drives basically the customer experience and this all translates into a customer's uh, insights which go back to the business as an insight and business evolve and they, they design their solutions for the customers. Basically. If you look at the entire three years or four years, last three, four years, uh, it is not only that consumer is reaching or, or entering into a store and looking at the shelf and then selecting the product. It is basically they are reading out the entire information of the product, which goes into the, what are the ingredients goes into the product. Even today, like somebody was mentioning uh, earlier also in the earlier discussion that uh, they, they are creating ads of six to seven minutes so that customer is fully aware what he's going to use in, or by applying this product or by buying this product actually whether he's getting he or she is getting the value for money or not so all these changes has happened and this this all translates into customer experience ultimately uh, giving challenges or uh, uh, perspective to the retailers or the manufacturers to design their production solution accordingly Right. So I think the, the last part you men mentioned in terms of the way the products are designed or the services are designed, that itself has sort of changed the way the uh, organizations are uh, uh, like, you know, dealing with their customers, which means that the journey starts right from your product development and not simply at the last mile automation. Now speaking about sort of new business models or new uh, services uh, emerging, I think this is the right time for me to maybe uh, quickly turn uh, towards Ashutosh, who is the regional business head uh, for uh, Big Basket. Now, Big Basket, Ashutosh, as, a, as an organization, I think uh, online grocery platforms uh, may have seen maybe the most uh, sort of significant tectonic shift over the last three years. And uh, maybe this is one uh, area within uh, the e-commerce which might have seen a lot of jump with uh, new technology, new players, and new business models like quick commerce uh, emerging. Now, when it comes to supply chain, obviously it has been uh, like, you know, sort of a very significant shift. So if I have to ask you about what are the two or three maybe key challenges that you have seen in supply chain over the last two, three years, which ultimately have to uh, also cope up with the kind of shifts that have happened at the front end. Right. Hello, everyone. So. COVID was like an earthquake, right? It came and shook everyone. Some of them collapsed. So what is collapse? Nothing is there. But those who survived, now if you see, you will not be able to see any change. It is just exactly as it was before the earthquake. So the new normal is actually back to the old normal. That's the biggest difference. So people who talk about, you know, now no one is wearing a mask. And we have been this way since almost a year now. Last big wave was in last January. So most of the COVID changes are now back. And I have great stories of you know what changed in COVID and what we did in COVID and what helped us in COVID. But the biggest thing is now from a customer perception and customer requirement, we are all back to pre-COVID days. What has changed though is the penetration of e-commerce has gone up so much that now things which were not feasible before COVID because of the whole density that problem has been solved for. So now the customer base has increased. So we, for example, in Big Basket tried a quick commerce model five years back and we shut it down because the economies were not making sense. Now again, the quick commerce is on a rise and in fact at a 10 minute delivery promise and while uh, I am not exactly sure if the 10 minute will survive, quick commerce is here to stay because of the sheer density of customer base, things which were not viable in the past are now viable. The way we have to manage this at a supply chain level is 
when the earthquake is going on, we have to be flexible. Rigid buildings fall down. So we have to be flexible when any turmoil happens. At the same time, we have to be rigid after the turmoil is over. And that starts from the back end. It starts from, you know, for example, in Wickbasket, we have worked on strengthening our supply chain, buying directly from farmers five years back. And that is giving us dividends now when the competition is really, really, you know, sort of in our face. While they might sell the packaged food for a fresh, they will never have the back-end supply chain that we have. At the same time, there will always be disruptions. There will always be someone coming in the last mile and doing something innovative. What we have to be is quickly innovate to whatever changes are going on in the market and whatever is the flavor of the season. So this balance between being flexible and still being stable is what we have to play as a supply chain professional. So just just to uh, sort of catch uh, on to that, so as you said, uh, uh, like you know, so you have uh, done some proactive sort of measures to make sure that on a long term it is going to help you. So now with all this sort of burst of uh, quick commerce players coming and then which it basically means that the entire supply chain infrastructure as well as the network, the way that you have planned has to be sort of con maybe continuously rethought. So then what is sort of a uh, like you know horizon that you generally look at because maybe in the olden time when you used to plan for maybe three to five years, I think that is now completely senseless. Correct. So, what is the type of horizon you plan for then? What is the right horizon? With COVID look? coming in 2020, all the vision 2020 plans were scrapped. So, similarly, I think five years are, uh, you know, <laughs> too long a horizon to plan anything nowadays. And I, I generally agree it has to change. So, what helps us is whenever there is a quick shift in the market. Like for example, currently quick commerce is a emerging thing since last one year. Two years back, no one was into quick commerce space, right, per se. And we have to first adapt. And when we adapt and react quickly, we cannot look at synergies from day one. So what we have to be is quick, nimble on our feet, start and you know, not sort of miss the bus, not be a, a, a Kodak and you know, miss the digital uh, wave in, in that perspective. At the same time, the advantage that we will have always is since we have established a very strong backend and a very strong base, as we move in this quick commerce space, for example, or any other, I feel, disruption that comes in, we will always have opportunities to keep getting synergies and that is what we do. So we, even in quick commerce, we have opened in dark stores now very quick and now we are working to bring the unit economics down, to bring the cost efficiencies up by relying on the back end which we have developed through the last 10 years. So I think this is true for any disruption. First, you, have, you can't be caught napping, you have to react very fast and then you have to see how you stabilize and use your strengths and not play into the strengths of the competition rather. Uh, so now next question uh, from my side will be to uh, Vivek, who is apart from uh, being the director of operations at CIPLA, is uh, an author and a public speaker. Uh, so Vivek, I think while uh, in this entire discussion of customer experience, sometimes the D2C players sort of get the most publicity and the attention. But uh, large parts of India still relies on the brick and mortar uh, kind of model. And I'm sure those are also an area or those are the leaders who also need to cope up with the same uh, type of challenge while their sort of consumers might be slightly different. But then nevertheless, we are not completely moved to that D2C model. So from brick and mortar stores perspective, what do you think are the supply chain leaders now doing and how they are basically adjusting to the new normal? Sure. Hi. So, uh, so essentially, see, if I, if I look at the broad D2C scenario in the country, there are two kinds of businesses. One is the companies who have born and grown as pure play D2C. Uh, so they have a different style of upbringing and hence the way, to, way of looking at the business. And the other one which you mentioned are the traditional brick and mortar organizations, companies or businesses who are very, very strong in traditional trade or general trade. Uh, they are the kings of that uh, area. But now they are building or in the process of building strong D2C businesses, right? So uh, if I talk about the second set of com companies, I think the, cha the challenges with them uh, are very different, okay? And I think the, the biggest challenge is the mindset change. Uh, when I say mindset change, it, it starts right from the business leader to the, the team, uh, uh, you know, uh, up to the last mile. Uh, um, uh, what are those challenges? I think uh, top of them, uh, first, uh, it's very difficult for the brick and mortar organization to understand that when, it, when they are setting up a D2C business, the, the boundaries between a marketing and a supply chain function blur and blur to a very, very large extent. For example, uh, they, they, uh, the, they must understand that, for example, what they are promising on the website uh, in terms of number of days of delivery uh, is basically the supply chain confidence. 
and what supply chain delivers deci decides the whether the customer comes back or not. Correct. So, the, so the boundaries are blurred, uh, uh, and it can take uh, the the demand generation efforts to a very different wasteful level if supply chain doesn't deliver, and vice versa. Right. Uh, secondly, for example, uh, my favorite is the cost of unavailability. Right. Uh, uh, in brick and mortar, we are we are very very used to uh, uh, you know a strong inventory pipeline, which means there's a primary sale, then there's a secondary sale, then there's the tertiary sale, and you know if my team screw ups in the warehouse, the customer doesn't suffer. Right, but in in D2C, uh, everything is customer, right? So so there's nothing in between, and the cost of un unavailability is again extremely high and unpardonable to the extent, right? Uh, uh, the the definition of last mile changes. The last mile for for me as a brick and mortar is my distributor, but for for the for for, uh, for, for a D2C and and when I'm setting up a D2C business, I understand I'm I'm directly exposed to the customer. So uh, the importance of alerts and timely and accurate alerts is much more important, right? And 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 if you ask me, um, uh, you know. The difference between cost and value, uh, you know, undergoes a very different change. Um, uh, you know, um, um, we are very fond of budgeting, right? Uh, supply, especially the supply chain folks, right? Now, um, uh, what we must understand is that uh, if I am delivering something in half a time with one and a half x the cost, I am still creating more value for my business. I, I think, I think then I forego the idea of cost for some time and start talking about the value creation. I think that's where uh, you know there are the few challenges which I believe uh, the brick and mortar companies who are trying to venture into D2C or making strong businesses in D2C need to understand and you know uh, sort of you know have their hands around it. Yeah, thanks. Right, right. Thanks. So I think that uh, part you mentioned where basically we are saying that the supply chain is not only able to uh, cut the cost but also create a value, right? and I think that is more true in case of brick and mortar store uh, than anything else. Uh, now, coming back to uh, uh, the sort of D2C model or the digital marketplace, uh, so let's let's move to Sankar. So Sankar is the chief supply chain officer with uh, Plum, which is uh, sort of an up and coming uh, uh, beauty products brand in India, which has been around and now getting more and more attention. So Plum, uh, uh, Sankar, as we know, it's a like you know brand which offers sort of toxic free uh, products, vegan products, which is a uh, like you know maybe for more conscious customers or maybe more aware customers who are looking at not only what their product is but also how it is sourced, how it is processed and then ultimately like you know uh, the, the quality management, so the entire journey. So now considering that maybe the, uh, the consumers you are targeting are more sort of learned and aware about these things, how are you making sure that uh, they are also having some kind of a visibility into the way uh, the supply chain is working because then in that case, you are uh, like you know not only uh, bothered about how the efficiencies are brought in or how the customer experience is ultimately met, but also looking at how do you provide that visibility or that transparency to the uh, end consumer, which makes them sort of more uh, uh, trusting in your brand. Yeah, thanks, Manda, for asking that question. So first of all, transparency is one of our core values for the company, along with uh, customer delight, sustainability, and respect. So transparency is not only there in supply chain for Flum, it is across the company as a whole. Now talking about uh, you know, things that you asked about, uh, trust, transparency in quality, etc. So the D2C life is very difficult. The feedback is instantaneous. So whatever happens, it gets exposed online with the reviews and ratings, etc. So quality, number one, is of paramount importance. So we cannot be giving tall promises and not delivering when the customer is actually using it. So quality aspect, we have to be very transparent. We, the customers are le learned, uh, as you also said. They do understand what kind of ingredients are there in the product. They want specific ingredients. We have got requests for, from customers asking what kind of version of the molecules they are using. So that's the level of uh, you know, demand that the customer is having. So for them, quality is number one importance, and we have to be very transparent about that. Coming to processes, uh, so some things that we do, we do share our lab videos online or behind the scenes video wherein we show how a lipstick is being made or manufactured in our, in our manufacturing facility. So those are the videos which gets maximum engagement. That shows that the customers are really, you know, uh, wanting to know the details of how what goes into the product, what, how it is getting manufactured. So that transparency is also something that we provide and help, it helps us. And third thing on the you know, sourcing as well. So 
sustainability as Dinesh mentioned is already kicked in. Uh, every consumer wants a su sustainable package. He wants to know that whatever he is consuming, he or she is consuming, is not having any ma major negative impact on the environment. So that has already kicked in. But things like ethical sourcing, so where the products are sourced from, those I think is not yet come in India, but it is something that is going to come. So that is also something that we are aware of as of now. Maybe in the future we will do something about that as well. And one last piece, as uh, you know, uh, Vivek also mentioned about uh, the last mile. So that's one area where everybody is being transparent and that's something that is like an industry norm now. So whenever somebody is ordering anything, the customer is uh, immediately wants to know the promise or the ETA. And he wants the product to arrive on within that ETA, the promise uh, delivery date as we call technically. But uh, the other thing is that the it is okay if we are not able to deliver on that day. All that customer is asking is the transparency. If you are delayed by one day, please inform me one day in advance so that I can plan for it. So, so how all this transparency adds on is it builds the trust in the brand. And it's, uh, once the customer gets the trust in the brand, he or she is also being willing to reciprocate by being more transparent. So the kind of reviews and the ratings that we get, not ratings exactly, but the reviews that we get is with genuine interest to improve the brand or the product. So we get very specific inputs, genuine from the customers, which we can take back. So it's, it's actually the tra transparency building into trust. Again, it goes back to transparency from the consumer and which, you know, it's in a positive virtuous cycle. And that's how transparency helps not only supply chain, but overall the brand uh, trust as well. Thanks. Thanks for uh, touching upon that uh, topic. So, in fact, uh, uh, you, you, you made a reference to ESG and that is basically an area of so sustainability or environment. I think the consumers are become more and more aware of it. And while we may say that it may be like, you know, limited to maybe some affluent uh, consumers sit, uh, like, you know, staying in metro area, that is not true because like, you know, so we do a lot of work in the ESG domain and we have now realized that it's, it's sort of becoming an all-pervasive issue. So, so coming to Dinesh, since like you know, you apart from uh, the other functions, you also uh, lead the sustainability uh, practice in Reliance Retail, which is sort of a uh, like you know an area of uh, attention nowadays. And I think there are a lot of talks, and maybe some of the initiatives when it comes to sus sustainability or even social. I think uh, uh, Sankar referred to sort of ethical sourcing. So many of these things sometimes are there only on the portal to sort of create that brand value or maybe awareness. When it comes to putting these practices in ground, what has been your experience and uh, uh, more than that, how would you then basically advise the other uh, uh, retail companies in India to make sure that they are taking maybe slow but at least firm uh, steps in the direction of uh, being sort of more ESG compliant? Uh. If I, if I look at the sustainability as a buzzword, so this sustainability word in the market is around for last 10 years. Uh, somebody is calling it sustainability, somebody was calling it ESG or ESG or SHE, so you call it by any name, so but, but sustainability is always a, a buzzword in the industrial after revolution and, and it came into. Basically, it, it's all about how sustainable your business is, how, what you are doing, how you are doing, how ethically you are doing, and what you are leaving it here for next generations, basically. So when, when I look at the sustainability part for the retail, uh, retail uh, people or, or retailers, basically, uh, so, so when, when the commencement of this e-commerce started, lot of uh, shipments started coming in packaging boxes, and packaging consumption has increased at multifold in, in e-commerce channels. When, when it was a scenario when your father or my father goes to a Kirana shop and they carry their own uh, uh, cloth bag and they bring those groceries. But nowadays when somebody, uh, consumers placing an order on e-commerce platform and they're getting in a, either a paper carry, bo carry bag or a polythene carry bag. So their, the consumption of packaging has increased a lot. So when it, it increases, ultimately we, are the, we, we have to take the ownership as a retailers or as an e-tailers if I say. We need to work on how we can put back this packaging material which gone into the system or ecosystem as a dump or as, as, as a waste generation, how we can bring back it into the circular economy. So what I can say at this point of time is that sustainability was there. People were looking at the sustainability, but how we can bring small changes in our day-to-day -day work or routine work 
that sustainability remains relevant to our businesses, our businesses remain more sustainable and relevant to our next generation as well. So, uh, so if I if I uh, count three or four steps which we can take as as, as a uh, as a uh, towards a step towards sustainability is basically we can uh, our contribution towards a circular economy how we can create when we are designing a product we we should keep in mind the life cycle assessment of the product itself what is the end life of the product when if I am launching any a product or a service how it is going to be there in the system and how it is going to be what what will be the end of the life of that product. Uh, if, if I start designing my product in a way that I know the end of the product, definitely I will be clear on what I am producing is uh, going to be sustainable and it is going to be remain in the system and how it is going to be add value to the system. Uh, now, now look at the say, uh, look, say if I do something like people are doing uh, in, in current scenario, people are switching from plastics to paper carry bags uh, without even considering the one kg of paper, if, if somebody wants to create a one kg of paper, it takes almost 100 million, uh, 100 liters of water and then we have to cut so many trees. But if you look at the plastics, plastic is so sustainable that you can use multiple times that plastic bag or carry bag in the market. You can recycle it, you can reuse it in the same weight of the paper and, the, and, 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 and one tenth of that weight of the plastic uh, so plastic packaging you can use for the same purpose which, which was the paper bag was designed for that. Now we have to be very conscious about it because one side we are saying that plastic is uh, non-sustainable and it is, it is because of us that because, because we are littering that around it. If we, we put a recycling mechanism in our organizations and across the ecosystem, the way that today paper is getting recycled and we can create that ecosystem in our, in, in our local uh, urban bodies and, 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 and our scenarios, definitely this plastic recycling will be a huge change in our ecosystem and it will be a much more value addition than, the, than shifting from plastic to paper. So if I look at, uh, there are multiple ways we can contribute. One way is to bring everything into a circular economy so that, we, that the things remain in the system. We, are, we become more, less dependent on the crude oil or the conventional sources of energies. Already organizations have taken steps into going into solar energy, then using hydraulic energy, then, then, then other modes of energy, creating energy. At the same time, if we switch normal lights to LED lights also, then becomes a sustainable point of look, looking at the sustainability. So if, if, if I look at the sustainability, then sustainability is basically what we are doing in our daily basis and how we can contribute as an individual, as an organization to become or to make our processes are products more sustainable that will I think help the entire system. Sure, sure. Thanks Dinesh. So, so coming back to you uh, Vivek, so see the way now basically the supply chain leaders are looking uh, more and more uh, into details into what the consumer wants, Do they are they only looking at speed or are they all the also looking at efficiencies. So constantly thinking about the consumer apart like you know going beyond your normal KPIs which are basically typically around your inventory levels and cost. So I think one of the key challenges the organizations are facing is to bringing in that culture of like you know thinking about consumer experience rather than like you know your typical KPIs when it comes to uh, uh, the supply chain management. So how do you think the organizations are sort of trying to instill that new culture because apart from that whatever operations, operational changes or technology you put in will not really serve you unless there is that change in the culture. So how do you think are the organizations coping up with this scenario? That's a, that, that's a, that's a very relevant, relevant question for the evening here because, because you know, uh, whatever uh, each word which has been spoken since morning here by various people, various experts at various levels of organization meets its moment of truth with people, right, finally, even if it's technology, right. Uh, uh, now, uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, D2C organizations or supply chain organizations, uh, um, you know, they are, they are typically known for both. Uh, there's a very clear dichotomy which sits in terms of people. Now, there's, there's the so-called white collars and the blue collars, or I would say the 24 degree Celsius, which is air conditioning, uh, you know, uh, uh, folks, and the 48 degree, which is, which is the uh, field force, right? Now, uh, um, uh, the culture needs to be looked at uh, very, very differently from both angles. 
very, very separately because the needs and the motivations are very different, right? If I talk about the first set of people, uh, which is all of us sitting here, I think um, uh, it's time and rather the time has already gone by when we have this concept of internal customer in the, in the, in the organization. I think that's gone. Um, if, if you tell a guy, if you tell at least a person in supply chain that the customer he's, uh, he's, he's set to or is poised to delight is the final customer only, not the internal customer, it, it takes his or her self-esteem to a very different level. He starts attaching the, the value to his work even more. I, I think that's where um, uh, the, 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 the magic portion lies. Uh, secondly, uh, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a truth now that supply chain and technology are not are, are no two different functions, right? So uh, the affinity towards technology has to be much more. Uh, and the kind of um, uh, the growth uh, this country is observing, uh, witnessing, uh, we already are in the dearth of our talent uh, with respect to technology, right? Now, how to overcome that in terms of culture change is that finally it's time we all start talking about making the technology fun because Nobody taught, taught us or nobody or anybody, anybody didn't t t taught uh, teachers Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat because it's fun. I do it for my own fun, right? But when it comes to work, when I go to work, the, the same technology may sound slightly monstrous to me. You know why? Because, because I think that, that affinity has not got established, right? So uh, that's the second intervention which, which is urgently required in the ecosystem. Uh, the last and again my personal favorite in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the so-called managerial or supervisory uh, kind of roles is that, you know, uh, in India still there are very few formal training courses or certifications or classroom programs on supply chain. A lot of people end up in supply chain through, you know, uh, various other functions, right? Uh, apart from few B schools, which is which is which is uh, not a very democratic, uh, democratically available across, right? So uh, I think uh, uh, it's time for us as leaders to, uh, you know, uh, tickle that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the 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 learning process in our existing supply chain teams by helping them realize the depth and width of their own functions, which they tend to forget because they get bottled in one area of the company which they are working day in day out. Uh, so they, don't, they, they forget what, they, what other things they know or they have been doing in the previous organizations. A quick word on blue collar, uh, the, 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 the heroes who make the real difference, right? Uh, I'm talking about the drivers, the delivery executives, the, the sales guys, right? Uh, I think uh, it's time again, you know, uh, to maybe start talking more about custom orientation than target orientation. We were, we were out there talking about how, uh, how a delivery guy might drive on the wrong, wrong side of the road because he needs to, you know, uh, sort of meet a target, right? So he risks himself and, and five others, right? Uh, uh, and in the process, uh, screws up on customer experience, right? Secondly, uh, do you think it's now time, especially COVID has taught us, that it's now time to start taking care more about the people, uh, you know, who are sort of called as contractors, you know, be it uh, our, our warehouse operators, be it our third party uh, folks, because these are the guys who actually have customer experience in their hands. A, a, a small issue or a small, uh, you know, uh, error in a in a pick and pack operation can, uh, you know, go, uh, uh, you know, waste the entire effort which has gone to acquire that one customer. And we have been talking about customer acquisition cost all through since morning, right? So I think they, these are a few thoughts. They are tough, but I think a lot of organizations have started making changes towards them. And I think the sooner the better. Thank you. So, Mandar, if I have to just add to one very interesting thing that you pointed out was that Facebook and YouTube, I do it because it's fun. So, we had a similar problem with our delivery riders, wherein we wanted them to follow a particular, you know, uh, click uh, way to, to get a better customer experience. And this, in the, the general consensus on why they were not following the process is they are not tech savvy. And when I visit the warehouse and I see them, this guy knows how to de download a movie from BitTorrent and do it, which frankly I did in engineering maybe, but I don't even know how to do it on my mobile. And this guy knows it. So a simple click through, why, why would he struggle with that technologically? The problem is it's not one intuitive. Second, it's better for him to avoid it than to do it. And hence to devise a UI UX even for as simple as a delivery rider, right? So that it is easier for him to do it rather than to bypass it helps in finally achieving the CX. And which is why I feel, you know, the supply chain plays a very key role in the CX, wherein supply chain, because it's end to end, finally interacts with the customer at the same time, it 
sort of delivers all the steps that a final customer either appreciate or say something bad about. So if we are looking at whatever customer is saying and see which type of the supply chain there is a failure. For example, sir, you were talking about packaging, right? Yes, sir. And uh, we, we try to do all our deliveries without packaging. What I mean is, obviously, we do use pa tertiary packaging. We bring it back. So all the deliveries that we happen from slotted deliveries, even up till quick commerce, we try to bring all the packaging material back. And when we try to go to the next step and remove the secondary packaging, as I was talking about fruits and vegetables, people did not like it. And while it's a very generic term to say people did not like it, some people really appreciate the fact that, you know, any which way is the plastic bags which you put your potatoes in, I have to throw away, why should I throw away, and so on and so forth. Some people found it often hassle. So the, this feedback has to go way up and they have to devise a better solution that maybe only a small segment of customer needs their secondary packaging. Can we come up with a way to let it go for the majority of the customer and hence create a better CX for the entire customer base. Because the problem with customer base is while we talk about a customer base, it is a big base. It's not one person. My kid likes strawberry, but my sister's son actually likes chocolate, right? Just saying that strawberry is the best customer is something with your head in the air. You have to realize what do people want and can supply chain be nimble enough? to cater to individual need at the same time being broad enough as a process to cater to the entire base. So I think just to uh, like you know extend upon what you mentioned because we, I think we had this discussion when we were preparing uh, for it. So I think as I think what the, the key takeaway uh, if I have to do from what you said is that uh, we need to give the choice to the end consumer. So whether I want that packaging or whether I don't want uh, that packaging, it's rather than being preachy and say like you know for my ESG initiatives now you change your ways of working. I think at least to an extent we need to give them the choice and then make sure that we are equipped to then uh, basically meet those. The only caveat there also is the customer also, it's not one person, it's a base. So sometimes they also don't know what they want. Mere bachche ko mitti khana pasand hai. Doesn't mean that's good for him. So we have to give him the flexibility and choice at the same time doing it in a manner that it is sustainable. So I can deliver that experience across all customers, across all timelines. So right. that balance is what supply chain actually plays. Great, great. Yeah, so I think, uh, so, so talking about balance, now considering that India is still like, you know, large amount, uh, 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 large uh, extent of our population uh, lives in the uh, rural areas and uh, we all know in the last two, three years, like, you know, things have changed, right, because of the work from home scenario or the flexibility people are getting in their work culture. Many people and I, I myself, so for example, for a couple of years, I was staying in my uh, village. Uh, working from home uh, with, with excellent Wi-Fi facilities. So now uh, coming to uh, uh, Sankar maybe so and I think this has been a shift that we have seen and yes while large part of the population has now again moved back into the metro, all the organizations are sort of pleading their uh, employees to come back to the offices. But this whole balance between the rural population and urban population and the way uh, uh, the retail players were uh, looking at that has like you know undergone certain change in the last few years. So, so, so based on that now uh, in your experience say tier 2 and tier 3 cities have again like you know got a lot of prominence and everybody is sort of scrambling to see how they can uh, be more flexible to serve them. So what is, what is your opinion and what is your view in terms of how this uh, like you know sort of the balance between the urban and rural consumers is being met by the organizations. Okay. Uh so I'll tell the experience from Plum and also my previous company, Amazon. So, so the really, the, I, uh, I would not like to dissect it between urban and rural, but definitely tire one, metros, tire one, tire two, tire three. And as you rightly said, COVID has really changed the game. A lot of people have, you know, went back to tire two, tire three cities. Uh, and now they, they, a lot of people don't even want to come back to metros because they like the lifestyle there and they're, so they, are, they are sustaining their income at uh, you know, that level even in the tier 2, tier 3 cities. So these are the tier 2, tier 3 cities population which, which has a huge size of wallet and they don't have shops in their neighborhood but they have the spending or the purchasing power and that's uh, you know thing that we all can go at. So especially a D2C brand like us, we have got anybody can shop from anywhere. All I need to do from a supply chain point of view is to design my supply network such that I am able to deliver the promise. Uh, with the right speed. So, so if I can land that properly in terms of uh, how do I manage my, do I take a air uh, delivery or do I do surface, to what extent do I need to do surface, to what all cities or pin codes we need to do air, those are the things I need to crack. So if I do crack that, uh, that is, uh, you know, I can t take, 
take their big uh, size of wallet. Second, and also can do one more thing, uh, I can design my entire uh, fulfillment centers as per the tier 2, tier 3 cities. I have a lot of data from my D2C website. I know which PIN codes are getting what kind of orders and where do I need to uh, open my fulfillment centers or uh, no, CFA depots, etc. So that designing also something that can play a huge role and inventory replenishment, all these things. So if we can you know, uh, design the supply chain pro properly. These are the customers who can be easily delighted and they have a huge, uh, you know, uh, sh they, we can have a huge share of business from them. Uh, it's, it's just a myth that all the, you know, uh, premium or prestige brands are only consumed by uh, the, um, uh, the metro population. It's not at all true. I have the data. I, I know which pin codes are, are ordering a lot of premium skincare products uh, or a hair care product. And trust me, it is the tier two and uh, tier two cities uh, which are, you know, having a maximum share for us as well. Right. Right. Thanks. So I think, so, so having spoken about basically the rural and urban population, so I think continuing on the same track, so coming back to you Vivek, uh, so as I understand you are uh, uh, a part of the CII's uh, uh, supply chain uh, leadership group and uh, I, as I understand you do a lot of work uh, along with CII plus like you know see how sort of the the government can also uh, sort of participate or be a stakeholder in the way the supply chain is changing and like you know the consumer experience is uh, coming at the forefront. So would you like to share with us few initiatives uh, that are being undertaken by sure. your group? Yeah, so I think uh, 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 this is a very interesting collaboration, you know, between CII. Uh, uh, so CII is basically a facilitator between the government, the administration, and the and the industry, right? And um, if, just one small example is that you know uh, when uh, Prime Minister Modi announced the national logistics policy a few weeks ago, a lot of inputs came uh, through this uh, committee. We are a good 30-member committee uh, uh, of supply chain folks across the industry. Uh, now, uh, a few specifics on what's happening. Uh, one, our immediate uh, uh, focus is to help government put together uh, what's called uh, India Supply Chain Vision 2030, wherein you know a lot of work is happening for the future. Uh, you know, to silently build the back end of uh, uh, you know the businesses in in the country. Uh, so we have six of five or six work, uh, you know actionable work groups who work there. Uh, for example, one of them is, uh, you know, working on uh, what you call as a digital freight exchange, you know, uh, uh, for the country, right? So that, you know, um, uh, uh, it becomes easier, tech-driven and efficient for the, for the, for the, for the businesses to uh, have the information around freight. Uh, automated warehouses is another one because a lot of developed countries, they work on pelletized loads, but India isn't, right? Uh, the first problem we hit when we talk about pelletized load is my own warehouse doesn't have a dock leveler and a forklift and, you know, or so and so forth, you know. To, to enable that. So uh, we itself start calling it automation right from there, right? So how do we go about it? I think track and trace is another uh, big area this group is working on. The track and trace used to be a pharma buzzword a few years ago, but now I think with, with e-commerce and D2C uh, uh, becoming so big in the country uh, uh, and, and the challenge of pilferages and uh, uh, um, counterfeits and authentications, I think track and trace will become very big and a, a strong need for the industry. Um, sustainability stays as one of the uh, uh, biggest biggest objectives uh, for us as the forum. And I think the last one and my personal favorite, which I spoke in my earlier response was also skill development. You know, uh, So we are working very closely with the Logistics Skill Council of India uh, to develop, uh, you know, uh, uh, a, a very strong army of uh, delivery uh, executives, uh, uh, truck drivers, you know, warehouse operators, uh, you will be delighted to, you know, uh, hear that, you know, uh, uh, this particular um, uh, institution has uh, uh, trained a, a big batch of truck drivers for Japan, for example, because uh, that country is running out of drivers, right, and uh, they, are, they are facing real issues in that. So I think these are few areas where a lot of strong work is happening on the ground in association with the industry and CII is playing a very, very strong role in making all this happen. Rather, um, uh, for the first time last year, Logistics Excellence Awards were launched, uh, you know, uh, uh, for the industry, which were sponsored by the Department, uh, Ministry of Commerce, uh, you know, un under Department of Logistics. So I think um, uh, a lot of uh, strong work is being championed by the Government of India uh, and, um, uh, you know, uh, a lot of it is taking shape very, very fast in the country. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Vivek. So now, uh, I think we have uh, just few minutes left. So maybe I will just uh, 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 reach out to the speakers for a uh, few sort of closing remarks. So, so coming to you, so Ashutosh, so I think we have now discussed basically uh, how the, uh, the, the supply chain is not 
sort of coping up with the customer experience as a disruption, but sort of, sort of they have been working on it all along. I think some of, in some cases we have already seen the results, in some cases maybe the future holds more advancements in technology as well as the way the processes are run. So from the, uh, the perspective of D2C and the customer experience, how do you see the future in terms of, do you see more sort of disruption in terms of business models emerging or you think it will be a period of stabilization? So how do you see the next maybe one or two years? I will not go beyond that. So I, I think the way supply chain adds value, <laughs> time for <them> here. <laughs> I think the way supply chain adds value is obviously trying to, as I said, figure out what the customers and give it. So for example, you're talking about how the rural India works, right? So we tried our T2, T3 model around 3-4 years back and we had the similar cost track in supply chain trying to give a similar experience that we give in Bombay to a person in Nagpur and for uh, obvious reasons it was not taking off. So we did a couple of uh, group discussions and asked the customer kya chahiye. So I'll just share one customer inside and I'll say it in Hindi because the discussion was in Hindi. Usne bola ki, meri saas kya sochegi? Kya mein itni alsi hu ki mein alu piyas bhi bahar se nila sakti? And in my, and I was there, I'm in my mind, I can't find feminism right now, right? But I have to solve. So we realized that we, the value proposition cannot be the same. We were selling convenience in Mumbai. Nagpur guys don't want convenience. What they want is, is some value proposition which is respected. So we rejigged our entire supply chain, came up with a tighter cost tag. So in Bombay, for example, we have a 23% margin, 18% cost tag, 5% VN, right? We tried to do it in Nagpur says that the cost tag is only 15%. And then we can work with the 20% margin or 18% margin trying right, to deliver the same value. And that is where supply chain can actually cut the frills, understand what the customer was and give it what they want and not what we want to give. So that's I think the future of you know, any generation. Sure. So I think, uh, so we are done. So do we have time for questions and answers or we are moving into the next session? So yeah, maybe let's take one question from the crowd. I think people are respecting the buzzer. <laughs> Thanks, Vivek. Uh, so the question is for Mr. Batra. So, uh, you know, the biggest challenge uh, that we face right now is because it's volumetric weight and when you talk about packaging, uh, the challenge is whether to, and you mentioned rightly that sometimes the paper is more costlier than the plastic that you use. However, you mentioned about circling it across, like how to, how do smaller companies do that? Like, uh, I know from, for somebody like a Reliance, it, it can still be a part of the ecosystem, like you have so many stores and stuff like that. But for a D2C brand, how do they ensure sustainability and cost effectiveness at the same time? So it's basically wherever we can contribute, we should contribute. That's, that's the one part of it. Second, smaller companies also can, can, can contribute like partnering with NGOs, partnering with their customer base wherein they have the recycling facility or the big brands where they are already running this uh, milk run kind of thing to collect back the packaging material they are dumping in the market. So that way we can, I think, will be able to do some sort of solution. But this requires a lot of uh, partnership at a larger level or a bigger level to accommodate all. And one last thing, uh, we, we, you know, a lot of e-tailers use these tamper-proof plastic packaging just to ensure the security and of course uh, multiple terrains across India. So sometimes you, you know, it's, it's mismanaged, mishandled, the package is mishandled and now I've seen uh, a lot of bigger companies are moving to paper bags and which I feel is not very sustainable uh, from the business perspective in the sense that the paper bag can be torn and all those things can happen uh, on the way, not necessarily somebody is trying to do that, but on the way paper, paper bag can torn off. Uh, what would you uh, suggest to a company like that, whether temp well, is there another option for temper-proof packaging that um, someone can use? If, if, if you look at the paper bags are also not tamper proof. If you, if you try, if somebody wants to open it up, you can easily open it up and then re-stick it. That's, that's, you can, you can re-glue it basically or reseal it, you can say it. But uh, even if you look at the poly bags are also, a lot of R&D is going on behind or at the back end wherein to create those tamper proofness solution. It is basically one step ahead of the uh, people who are doing this pil pilfering. They know the crux how you can open the bag 
and again uh, taking out the item and reseal it. Uh, but it is basically a, what you can uh, you can say police and thief. The case is keep on uh, uh, changing the people here because thief know how to steal the things and police know how to chase them. So here also the people sitting at the back end packaging development team and they, they keep on reinventing what kind of glue can be uh, used, what, what sort of packages or what can like you, you must have seen the temper proof bags, they are normal hot glued but now uh, organization has started using security numbering around that, yeah. uh, one, two, three or four, five, six kind of numbering so that one step ahead of that. Now then there is a wide film also then you, once somebody tries to uh, open it the, you will find the color change or color shift of uh, the tape itself. So it is always basically continuous improvement kind of thing. Uh, right. There is no permanent solution as of such, but yes, uh, people are working on it. Uh, so that once it is tear off, it is tear off, that's way. But the flip side is that during the supply chain handling also, it may get uh, open up or torn because <coughs> of the handling we are doing. So there we have to take, uh, we have to create that kind of stiffness or strengthness, strength in the bag also that it doesn't, it, it can take the entire abuse, handling abuse in the supply chain and ultimately delivers a closed sealed bag to the customer. Yep. So it, if, if, I, if, if it's, it's a balance between how you can strike the balance between sure. these solutions. Thanks. So I just wanted to add one thing, one comment here, because you mentioned that the, the you know the return leg or the circular economy is easy to manage for a company like Reliance, but how do I do it as a D2C? So I, I would be you know, happy to share that we at Plum do that. We do collect our empty bottles uh, from our customers. It is a cost. It is costly, but we do it because of the intent. We want to have this you know sustainability as well. it is one of our core values. We want to do it. Uh, we have started it started to do it fr right from the inception till now we do it we do give customer discounts but this is all because that customer values that and he comes back to us because we do something which he values so that's it's all about the intent not to look at the cost to begin with if you want you can still do it thanks yep so thanks thanks a lot uh, so we would like to thank the speakers so sankar dinesh vivek and ashutosh thanks a lot for joining and thanks to all the audience